you think I wasn't going to mention her? You think I wasn't going to mention her? I brought her up. That's right, that's right. Okay, cool. Listen, guys. I think you're all nice and warmed up. You're ready for the main man. 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 The main much for coming. I uh, hope you don't mind if I take a seat. It's uh, been a long life, really. Uh, <laughs> it's nice to meet all of you. I'm Vidar. I'm from Sri Lanka. I moved to the UK about two years ago. And since I moved here, whenever I'm getting to know someone and I mention that I'm from Sri Lanka, there's always a certain segment of the population that feels the need to tell me about their, their life-changing volunteering trip through Southeast Asia. <laughs> you know, like an angel that fell from Europe. Yes. <laughs> is building schools in rural villages because cheap labor is very hard to find in developing countries. <laughs> they're, they're usually on their, their gap year. You guys know gap year is this great, this great migration that, that your middle class kids go on between finishing school and never achieving anything in life. <laughs> where they go visit the countries that their countries used to own just to check up on us. It's so... It's so thoughtful. It makes me feel safe. It really does. Uh, who would feed the baby elephants? It's the Lord's work. It's beautiful. Okay. At some point, they always take out their phones and start showing me pictures of them and their friends uh, traveling through Sri Lanka, taking selfies with little village children, which is fine, I understand. They're very Instagrammable children. I just... I just always wonder. What would happen if, say, if, say, I <laughs> snuck into a primary school in London, <laughs> started rounding up little British children for an impromptu photo shoot, just get them all in one corner, like, come on, kids, one, two, three, Allahu Akbar, and put that on Instagram before the police show up, this would go terribly for me. <laughs> Uh, since I moved here, a lot of my friends uh, are uh, British, Sri Lanka, British, Indian. Uh, uh, they'll always complain that when they're getting to know someone, they say that they're British. People always ask them, oh, but where are you really from, though? And I can never relate. I don't have these problems. Whenever I tell someone I'm from Sri Lanka, they're always like, yeah, that looks about right. <laughs> if anything, you look a bit too Sri Lankan. It's a bit much. It's, you don't even look like a city Sri Lankan. You look like a jungle Sri Lankan. <laughs> You look like you escaped your tribe and stole a gay cowboy's clothes. <laughs> Something I get the most often, even, is people like to tell me that I look a little bit like a, a chocolate Jesus. Uh, if I'm being completely honest, I don't even like this joke anymore. I'm just not successful enough to stop doing it yet. <laughs> Yeah, that situation. Yeah. Also, isn't it more like historically accurate Jesus, though? Uh, I don't even mind. I just love the idea of millions of conservative Christians going to church every Sunday to pray to a brown socialist Jew from the Middle East. With a... with a Mexican name? Uh, this makes complete sense. This is why the world is so messed up. Jesus has probably already come back. Jesus just couldn't get through immigration. <laughs> this man is stuck applying for a visa of a carpentry. It's embarrassing. But, uh, so people forget sometimes, though, so just to remind them if I'm bored on a Sunday morning, I'll just, just put on my favorite robe and... Let's go down to my local church like, guess who's back? <laughs> I should address my name, probably. My full name is Vidura Bandara Rajapak. I didn't always use my middle name. I only really started using it in a feeble attempt to distance myself from my last name. <laughs> because it happens to be the same last name as an evil president that's ruined my country. And I cannot stress this enough. I'm not related to this man, all right? I promise, I swear. <laughs> He's a bad guy, like any Sri Lankan will know, but he, we had a long civil war that ended in 2009. He was the Minister of Defense during the time, and he's uh, responsible for terrible war crimes. And since then, his decisions have ruined Sri Lanka's economy. But this name thing is affecting me personally. And that is unacceptable. Every time I meet another Sri Lankan, I need to explain to them that I'm not related to this guy. It's, usually it doesn't take too long, though. They'll, 
take a second look at me and very quickly come to the conclusion that it's very unlikely that I'm in politics. <laughs> the only thing I look like I've run for recently is the bus. I just have that line about me. Now, it's not just him, it's his whole family. His brother uh, was, the, was the prime minister. He had a bunch of his cousins, cabinet. Yeah, uh, it was a family affair, and I feel like, I feel like nepotism is okay sometimes. <laughs> like if you run an off-license, a corner shop, by all means, uh, that's free labor, that's why you have the children. <laughs> but when lives are on the line, that's when you, a line needs to be drawn, I feel like. like. They don't let brain surgeons let their knees sub in for them when they go to the toilet. <laughs> Saying stuff like, no, trust me, she's got my eyes. That's not how it works. <laughs> Sri Lanka is a difficult place to be from. You know, it's, a, it's a very beautiful country and it's nice in a lot of ways. I'm very proud of it. Uh, but it's also very troubled. It has a very violent past. You know, it makes you feel proud and ashamed at the same time to be from there. You know, it's the same feeling as dating someone that's incredibly attractive but with a terrible personality. <laughs> like you'll show pictures of them to your friends all day. As soon as they want to meet them, you're just like, nah, man, she's sick. Uh, <laughs> it's a bad time right now. <laughs> What she have? Polio. It came back just for her. This is, uh, uh, it's difficult. I feel bad talking badly about it. I feel like like immigrants from developing countries are like like rappers that made it out of the hood. Like after we've left, we'll talk about where we're from all day with pride. You could not pay a single one of us enough to go back. You could. <laughs> It's not even a question, they don't even have a word. We get deported, that's the word. We don't go back willingly. You know, since I moved here, I listened to a lot of UK rap music. I listen to this guy Stormzy. Uh, he's from Croydon in South London, and I know that because he feels the need to mention it in every other song. Uh, I looked up where this man lives now. This guy lives in Chelsea, all right? He very happily f forgot where he came from. Yeah. It's not like immigrants like we're even fe fleeing a terrible situation all of the time, you know, like my family uh, didn't have, oh, we, we were pretty all right. We were sort of like Sri Lankan middle class, which I do have to iterate is very different from your middle class. So we don't go to boarding school and have topiary gardens and shit. Uh, uh, I, I, since I moved here, I found the Sri Lankan middle class maps very well to sort of British working class values and worldview. Hell, I've met homeless people here with more entitlement than I have. Uh, and that sounds fucked up, I realize. But I'll give you an example. I was, uh, I was leaving a supermarket recently and I had my stuff with me and I saw a homeless man outside. Uh, so I took out an apple from my bag to give to him. And I swear this dude looked me in my eye and said, no thank you. I don't like Granny Smith. <laughs> But you know, that's a beautiful thing, in a way. You know, you should feel proud to live in a country where your most vulnerable people have specific fruit varietal tastes. That's amazing. I got them because they were on offer. <laughs> Uh, since I, I've been away from home for nearly a decade now, I was dating a lot since I first left home because, quite frankly, I also need material white people can relate to. And, uh, I can, I really do. <laughs> so I, I, was, I was on a first date a while back, and I swear the first thing this girl asked me was, so, does Sri Lanka have buildings? <laughs> and she was kind of cute, so I just went with it. Uh, <laughs> and told her the story of my childhood according to the plot of The Jungle Book. <laughs> like, I keep pictures of my dogs in my wallet. I just took them out like, so that's mama? <laughs> so that's papa. It was a very difficult time at home right now. Uncle Baloo's got the mange. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't easy, but they worked real hard, so we always had the bare necessities. <laughs> I'm sorry, you deserve better. That was in bad taste. <laughs> the first place my family moved to, uh, that's why my, my English sounds a bit American. My family moved us from Sri Lanka when I was about five years old to Piscataway, New Jersey, uh, in America. They did eventually move us home to Sri Lanka after four or five years so we could actually grow up in a more developed place. But <laughs> America wasn't all that bad. It has some things Sri, Sri Lanka doesn't have. It's part of why we moved. It has very, very safe roads, for example. You know, it has very orderly traffic. That's something Sri Lanka like most of the developing world can't really say it as. You know, Sri Lankans have very tenuous relationships with traffic laws. You know, Sri Lankans <laughs> treat traffic laws the same way America treats human rights. It's more of a suggestion. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a self-checkout type situation. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
<laughs> America's a very easy target these days. I really feel like, rightfully so. Uh, but I don't quite like it though when uh, British people, Europeans even, make fun of America because I feel like they're just doing all of the evil shit that y'all used to do. But they're better at it. <laughs> and now you're jealous. That's the vibe that I'm getting. That's, it feels a bit petty, it feels a bit resentful. I think you're better than that. Yeah. And the UK isn't even that bad. You all have sort of accepted your defeat. But that's what French people are the worst. These people are too proud of their own goddamn culture. Uh, they haven't done anything cool in like 200 years and they're still going on about it. I have, a, I have a French friend, we go to the movies together a lot, uh, and every time we go together, he feels the need to remind me about how the French invented cinema. Like, oh yes, the French invented cinema. Like, yes, that's nice, but what have you done for me lately? All right? <laughs> because America gave me pornography on my telephone. <laughs> in this lifetime. You know, movies are cute, but call me back when you can compete with fornication in the palm of my hand. This is amazing. <laughs> Now people ask if, if moving to America when I was that age was difficult, but I was somewhat of an obese child. So if anything, going to America was like going to the homeland of my people. <laughs> when I tell people I used to be a, a fat kid, they'll be like, oh, that, you must have been such a cute, such a cute chubby little child. Listen, nah, all right? It was a problem. I was so fat that my friends were worried about me, which is... If you know you're a young guy at that age, that's very unusual. Usually, if you're a guy at that age, anything weird about you, your friends make fun of. Like if you're a fat kid, your best friend will call you a fat fuck. You will call him a retard. Someone else will call both of you gay. And that's how we showed love. That's, that's how we used to bond. <laughs> Outside of my friends, I was bullied. Though I, I was fat in the 90s, all right? There was no... There was no body positivity for me back then. I, being fat in the 90s is like being a straight white guy now. Nobody cares about your feelings. Everyone's just mad at you for taking up space. It was a problem as well. There was no, there was no Lizzo for me back then. No, no beautiful charismatic musician to reassure a chubby young man that I was indeed still 100% that bitch. It just didn't work. Back then. You know, worst part though was moving back to Sri Lanka after getting even fatter in America, because at least when you're fat in America, you blend in. Uh, <laughs> my mother was always real nice about it, though. She'd tell me stuff like, you know, you shouldn't worry about all that. You shouldn't just do what you want and eat what you want. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what you look like. Very sweet lady. It doesn't matter what you look like. And as an adult, I can say that I have never been lied to <laughs> so blatantly in my entire life. Uh, I remember losing the weight as a teenager and people I already knew being nicer to me every time they saw me skinnier. It's like they could feel how much more oxygen was available in the room. <laughs> uh, I lost the weight, weight very quickly, very quickly. My mother got worried uh, and forced me to go see a nutritionist who diagnosed me with anorexia and bulimia at the time, and I was very upset that this stupid lady found out my plan. I very much knew what I was doing. I was a stupid teenager, so I was always on the stop eating diet. <laughs> the anorexia, at least, was very intentional. The bulimia, not so much. What happened was I would purposely starve myself for so, so much for so long that I would binge eat. I would eat a lot very quickly, uh, so quickly that I, I would feel so, so full that I'd throw it back up all by myself without having to force it. Oh, uh, I realize that sounds really sad and really fucked up, but you have to understand, in Sri Lanka, in a developing country, eating disorders, very privileged category of disease. Just <laughs> <laughs> getting a whole bunch of credit for something so many people around you are doing anyway, being hungry. It felt disrespectful, it really did. I'm sure every night I was retching into my toilet, there was a beggar outside listening to that bullshit like this motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> I, I felt disrespectful, I really did. Uh, I felt like a shitty Gandhi. Just, Cause this man wasn't actually poor, he was a well-educated lawyer that pretended to be poor to make the British leave in the only language they really understand, passive aggression. <laughs> you know, poverty was optional for this man. That's not how poverty works in real life. Poverty is a poverty if it's optional. Poverty, when it's optional, is camping. And I do not condone this behavior. It's not acceptable. What are you doing sleeping outside for no reason? It is. Uh, I feel like we know each other well enough to tell you all about my parents' divorce. <laughs> if you thought this was the product of a happy home, you need to readjust your expectations. All right? 
they finished the process of getting divorced when I was about 15, 16 years old, and I was very surprised because I always thought divorce was some rich people shit. <laughs> I heard my parents were splitting up, and my reaction was, wow, the family's doing better than I thought. <laughs> You two can get divorced, but you can't get me a PlayStation. I see how it is. This is... <laughs> and if anything, my, my life got a lot easier after they got divorced, really. Uh, because I, I was, I'm the eldest kid in the house, I have two little sisters, so I'd be the one mediating their fights very often. And after they split up, they could only fight over text message, so I got to be like a diplomat doing the Cold War, just relaying messages between these two assholes. Like, hey, Russia, can you not call America a dumb bitch before noon? That's my, that's my mother you're talking to. Yeah. But when they were together at home, they, they were very violent with each other, they'd fight all the time, and I'd have to get involved. Like, as young as like 13, 14 years old, I'd stay up at night and listen to them fighting. And if it got too loud, I'd go up to the door and look through the keyhole and see if it got physical. And if I saw a hand getting raised, I'd just, just rush in there like a little referee and push them apart. Like, come on guys, let's have a nice clean fight tonight, all right? <laughs> no closed fists, no uncut nails, open hand only. Will Smith rules in this house. <laughs> Show some decorum, this is silly. I always, I always took my mother's side because I, I love an underdog. And... <laughs> <laughs> no, but mostly we, we had a much easier relationship at the time, you know, because uh, my dad, I, I think any anger he couldn't take out on my mom. I was the only other guy in the house, so he took it out on me, he used to hit me a lot. Uh, it really upset me at the time, it still does, you know, I'm not, I haven't quite forgiven him for it. I have a little bit more empathy for it as I've gotten older, you know. He, he was around my, like a bit, only a bit older than me. He had three kids, just dealing with a lot. I, I feel like a grown man doesn't hit a kid half his size because everything's going well for him in life. <laughs> but people do strange things when they're having a hard time. If I'm having, having a terrible week, and I see a flock of pigeons just minding their own business, <laughs> I'll just check if the coast is clear and chase them around for a little bit. <laughs> assert my dominance over nature, you know. <laughs> And it wasn't too bad, my grandmother always lived with us, so whenever my dad would get at me, I would run through the house into my grandmother's room and hide behind her and wait till he came in and give him the finger from behind his own mother. <laughs> I felt very powerful. Yeah. And a part of me is happy that I had both of those influences growing up. I feel like anyone that ever amounted to anything had someone in their childhood that made them feel very special, and that was my grandma, and someone that made them feel like a piece of shit, and that was my dad. <laughs> and I don't think we would have ever heard of Michael Jackson if his dad, Joe Jackson, didn't treat him terribly. <laughs> because you know who Joe Jackson was nice to? Tito. <laughs> And half of you are wondering who the fuck Tito is. That's my point exactly. It got, it got a lot easier after I hit puberty though, because then I grew to around his size. I feel like any son that's had trouble with a violent dad remembers the first time you blocked his punch. That shit feels amazing. You feel like you're in Dragon Ball Z, you just block that shit. And then the thought crosses your mind like, oh shit, I can kick this old man's ass. And then you remember that he still pays for everything in your life and you let him continue. I was like, oh shit, Wu-Tang is right. Cash does rule everything around me. This is very irritating. That's why since I've, I was a kid, I've always viewed having some money, uh, uh, financial independence as freedom in a way. Like if I could get a job and get out of Sri Lanka and get away from this guy, I'd be safe by myself. You know, I can't wait to have so much money that I forget where I came from. That's where I'm, I want that amnesia money. I want... I want that Preeti Patel money where I turn my back on my people altogether. <laughs> Strangest thing to clap for, but all right. <laughs> Not really, because people say they have principles, but everybody's got a price. Uh, if I'm being completely honest, mine is not that high. Yeah. If you throw me a few grand, I'll go to the beach and kick back refugee boats myself. Like, not today, you broke motherfuckers. These are my white people. Uh, I got here first, finders keepers. This is... I told you not to clap. This is... <laughs> Uh, the first place I, I left uh, Sri Lanka before, I went to medical school uh, in, in Malaysia. I went to medical school because since I was a kid, I've always been very passionate about financial stability. And <laughs> why else would you do this terrible profession? Yeah. I learned that at a very young age. You know, I feel like it's unavoidable growing up in Sri Lanka. Uh, you learn at a very young age to dream practically, you know, like aim lower. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, I, I'd say, uh, want to do dumb things, I, like, what I thought was dumb at the time. I told my parents once that I want to be a chef, 
and they looked at me and said, as far as the world is concerned, boy, you're a cook. Uh, <laughs> that sounds very harsh in a way, but I really feel like they were protecting me. I, I really do. And just to iterate their point, my dad sat me down and put on Ratatouille, for, <laughs> which I thought was a beautiful, uplifting film. But he was like, no, really, really watch this. This, this film takes place in Paris, a city full of immigrants, just like you're going to be when you leave home. And who got the job? <laughs> A French rodent, all right? <laughs> this is where you stand. Why did he get it? Because he knew the owner's son. This is what you're up against. <laughs> That's an important lesson to learn at a young age. I feel like some people's parents lie to them and tell them that they're special and they can be anything they want to be and it'll all work out. And That's just not true. That's how people leave the house thinking they're going to be a CEO and are disappointed when they end up a project manager. You know, like musician, barista, <laughs> DJ, DJ. Uh, yeah. yes. <laughs> Not everyone I was in school with quite agreed with me. I had a few people uh, in my class who'd say things like, you, know, you shouldn't worry about all that. You shouldn't worry about employment. You, know, you should just, just go with the flow. You know, just go with the flow and the universe will provide. And to that, I say that the universe is a very strange nickname for your rich parents. I don't know <laughs> what that's a strange relationship it sounds like. I envy them though. I wish I grew up with money so I had this sort of level of confidence where I could just say dumb shit with enough charisma that it sounds profound. <laughs> you know, I, I, I wanna do things that contradict themselves and feel okay about it. I wanna do things like, like uh, be vegan, but do coke every weekend. <laughs> Because cows' lives are very important. <laughs> Colombians, not so much, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these are the same sorts of people that say things like, like money won't solve all your problems. No, money won't, this some shit. That, <laughs> that only someone that has always had money would say. Because if you've been broke, you know that at a certain level of brokenness, Money solves literally all of your problems, 100% of them. So I went to medical school, it was a very strange situation. It was Newcastle University in the UK set up this very sketchy twinning campus in Malaysia. And I remember them advertising it in Sri Lanka and the banners read, first world education at a third world price. <laughs> I was like, oh shit, that's my whole vibe. That's, <laughs> this was meant to be. <laughs> There's a lot of things in life you should try to get as much bang for your buck as possible. A medical ed education, not one of them. <laughs> you know, you, I went there and it really felt like this place was everyone's last resort. <laughs> the students and the teachers included. Uh, just to confirm, we had this very uh, weird uh, looking lecturer. His name was doc Dr. Adi Bagus. Uh, uh, you can do this after the show if you want. We Googled his name just to see what the, what the qualification, how legitimate these people that were teaching us were. And uh, his qualifications came up further down the page. But the first thing that showed up when we Googled his name was an article saying that he was on the run from the Indonesian government <laughs> for swindling sugarcane farmers. All right, this is some low-level crime bullshit. Uh, he passed away recently of a heart attack. Uh, I was very surprised because diabetes would have made much more sense. Uh, <laughs> it was a weird guy. It, it, it was strange. Like it, it made sense that a scumbag like that would be doing medicine though at the time, because I went into medicine thinking that it's good people that become doctors, and this is just not true. Uh, good people do things like teaching and social work and nursing even. You know, doctors are just the most competitive assholes in every school that decide to congregate later in life. This is professional sports for virgins. That's what it is. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I went to this place, it was in Malaysia. Malaysia was a very interesting place to go to school. It was a very conservative country, even more so than Sri Lanka. It's not great to begin with. You know, I met the bravest people I've known in my entire life in Malaysia. I met gay Malaysians because it's illegal to be gay in Malaysia. It's illegal for them just to be who they are, which is the most gangster shit I have heard in my entire life. I had friends that walked around every day like, nah, I don't commit crimes. I am a crime. What do you mean, <laughs> fuck you? Dudes, that's an intense individual. That's a lot to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. 
had a friend, his name was Ozzy. He, uh, uh, we, so Malaysia is on, uh, on the border with Singapore. So every weekend, he would take a three, four hour bus rides into Singapore just to be able to meet people, have relationships, live a normal life as he should. Uh, it was amazing, the confidence on this guy just trafficking his penis across the line. <laughs> it was wild. Just risking going to jail to get some dick. It was amazing. And he was so confident, even if he got caught, he would have done great in jail. He, he would make a sitcom about his life, call it Rainbow is the New Black Guy, watch the fuck out of it, it would be amazing. I wouldn't fare nearly as well in, in incarceration. My only hope of surviving in that environment would be to get a little hat and be everyone's spiritual leader. Just go around saying things like, nah, my brother, the real prison is in your mind. <laughs> Four hours on a bus to get some dick though. That, I must say, that must have been some truly amazing dick on the other side of that board. Like four hours on a bus, I don't have one hour on a train dick on a good day, all right? I'm not, I'm not being modest, I'm just aware of how averagely endowed I am. You know, my dick is like a, like a white basketball player. You know, he's not the biggest guy on the team, but he tries real hard. <laughs> He's got strong fundamentals, and uh, most importantly, he loves the game. <laughs> that is your one dick joke for the evening. <laughs> uh, he was from a very conservative family, my friend. Uh, so uh, now that he was away from home, he'd just say the wildest things, completely out of context. I think just because he felt free to do so for the first time. Like, we'd be having dinner together as a group, and he'd just randomly say something like, you know, I like Chinese boys because their little dicks don't hurt my asshole. And that was a lot. I didn't know how to take that. Like, is it homophobic if I think that's racist? What are the rules in this situation? How does this work exactly? <laughs> You know, I felt bad for him, though, that, that even at home, he, he couldn't be himself. Even his parents weren't accepting of who he was. Now, that's one thing I did get, I feel like I got lucky with, with my parents. Uh, as much trouble as they gave me, they were very uh, liberal people, especially for the region of the world that we grew up in. Uh, my mother a little bit too much, if anything. Uh, I remember when I was like 14 years old, we were in the, in the car together, we were waiting to pick my sister up from somewhere, and she just started asking me, like, hey, you know, I've noticed that I don't really see you hanging out with girls at school very often. And I was just like, leave me alone. I have nothing, I have nothing to tell you. Because I very much knew why this was the case. I played the flute and my sport of choice was archery, all right? <laughs> I was not doing myself any favors. <laughs> but she, she continued, she was like, yo, you know, if there's anything, if there's anything you need to tell me, anything at all, even if you're, even if you're, you know. What, you want me to come out as uncharismatic? What do you want from me? Leave me alone. <laughs> this is... <laughs> Uh, she was very understanding when I didn't continue doing medicine, though. Uh, I, I finished the degree, but I, I found another job. I uh, work in software engineering now. Uh, because, because I'm very committed to being a cultural stereotype, apparently. Uh, uh, a lot of the family was very upset that they no longer had a doctor to brag tell their relatives about. But my mother was real nice about it, mostly because she still uses me for free medical advice, because this woman is too cheap to go see a real doctor. Uh, it's fine most of the time. Uh, except for one instance where she thought it would be a good idea to ask her son about her contraceptive options. <laughs> because boundaries, what are those, you know? <laughs> it was the subtext of which being a mother asking her son, hey son, I want to start fucking again. <laughs> I need you to help me do this safely. Listen, if this is what progress looks like, I don't like it, all right? I, don't, I want nothing to do with it. <laughs> No, I just went along, I, I went into doctor work mode in my head and just, just took a full medical history from her. And she has a family history of venous thromboembolism, so my mother's on the copper coil, people. Uh, it's, it's definitely breaking my Hippocratic Oath, but also that's for paying customers only. This is public domain now. <laughs> The first place I left, uh, left Asia too, and then more as an adult, uh, I got a job in, in uh, Germany, in Berlin, in Germany. I moved there uh, as an immigrant, but I didn't know German, so a lot of the friends that I made uh, were English-speaking expats from other developed countries. There's a very subtle difference, you know, between an immigrant and an expat. You know, the easy way to say it is that immigrants are brown and black and expats are white, but that's too simple. <laughs> it's too simple, it really is. You met, ever met a Polish person? They get sad too. <laughs> 
uh, you need to ask someone why they moved to a place to really know. You know, an immigrant will say something like, you know, I moved here because I got a job. I was trying to get out of a bad situation back home, and I just wanted an easier life for myself or an easier life for my family. And an expat will say some shit like, I just heard the vibe was really chill. Just, uh, you know, some nonsense like that with a big smile on the face. Fuck. Yeah. Now I've caught wind though that immigrants become somewhat of a trendy word that rich white people in developed countries want to take from themselves because they can't let us have anything, apparently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not really, I've met people from uh, the US and Australia that have moved to the UK and like to call themselves immigrants. And that, that's fine, you know, they're not wrong, they're within their rights to do so. But I feel like that's the same as if Elon Musk, a white guy from South Africa, moved to America like he did and started calling himself African American. <laughs> It's technically correct. <laughs> but it just don't feel right, do it? It's... <laughs> now you can tell talking to people. I, I remember soon after I moved to Berlin, I was out just trying to make friends. I didn't know a single person in this goddamn country. Uh, I met this guy, from, he was from Sweden. And we got to talking, and he was like, yeah, you know, Berlin is, is really nice, so vibrant, so multicultural. Uh, it's, it's another thing about expats, they like to have black and brown people in the background, but not be friends with any. Uh, we're like houseplants, we add to the atmosphere. You know? uh, so vibrant, so multicultural. <laughs> That's what that means. <laughs> but, but the water is very hard in Berlin. And I just moved from Sri Lanka, all right? This was the first time in my life I had heard of the concept of hard water. You know, I thought the categories were drinkable and not drinkable. <laughs> and, uh, I just met the guy, I was trying to make a new friend, so I just went along with it. I was like, yeah, man, I get it. Oh, I can relate. Uh, <laughs> the water's very heavy back home, too, because we got rocks in it, you know? Same, same, but different. <laughs> It was such a party city, Berlin. It took a long time for me to get used to it. You know, these people treat partying like it's a, it's a full-time job. I swear I had a day off work on a Wednesday, and I messaged a friend like, hey man, you want to get lunch or something? And he replied, nah, sorry bro, I have an orgy to be at. You know how it is. <laughs> and I can't say I do. Uh, first of all, terrible at multitasking, but mostly. Mostly just something about the idea of being me alone, in a room full of Europeans holding whips and chains. <laughs> Just historically speaking, I did not feel like it was the best life decision. <laughs> But he was very nice, he tried to convince me to come along anyway. He was like, come on, man, it's on a boat. That's even worse. <laughs> wow. wow. That is probably how they got them the first time. Right? <laughs> so I went. <laughs> it's very interesting. It's not like you just show up and people are just having sex as soon as you get there. Yeah, I remember I went into a, a dark basement type room, something like this. Uh, there were just, just Germans marching in unison to techno music around me. Um, this was supposed to be a good time, apparently. Uh, you know, I just went along with it. Uh, but the only problem was that I, I just hate this music so much. It's, it's lack of rhythm offends me on a cultural level. It's, you know, I mean, electronic music is nice when you're on drugs. But also, everything is nice when you're on drugs. That's what, that's what drugs are for. But then I looked around, and I realized what had really happened here, why Germany loved electronic music so much. And I was impressed. I realized that Germany heard that the rest of the world thinks that white people don't know how to dance. So they decided to make their favorite kind of music something you don't need to dance to, right? <laughs> This is genius. This is what Europe has done for centuries. Whenever they're losing, they don't get better. They just move the goalposts. <laughs> you know, electronic music is just the Winter Olympics of music. That's what it is. <laughs> they thought they were good at sports, and then they started letting black people compete. And we're like, nah, we need snow immediately. <laughs> we need to hit the slopes right away. <laughs> It 
It was a real fun place to live, though. It was a very easy country to live in. By far, the most difficult part about living in Germany were uh, the Germans. They are really the worst. <laughs> they, they could all just leave and leave. <laughs> No, they were just very rude, and it's something I'm not used to. You know? But I came to respect it after a while. I came to respect it because I know now that rude people are the sign of a strong economy. That's, <laughs> that's their way of telling the rest of the world that they don't need you. <laughs> I say Sri Lanka, for example. I, I meet people that visit Sri Lanka and come back all the time, and they'll tell me how beautiful it was. I say it was so beautiful, such a beautiful place. But more than anything else, the people were with us so lovely. They're the nicest, kindest, most hospitable people I've met in my entire life. And I'm just thinking, yeah, that's because they need your tourist money, you idiot. <laughs> you know, our kindness is a hustle, all right? That's what it is. If we were half as nice to each other as we are to tourists, I would still be at home. That's... <laughs> We have all sorts of hilarious cottage in industries around the island. We'll do anything for a buck. We have, my favorite is, we have a very funny industry of, of straight male prostitutes in the southern part of the island. Uh, they're called beach boys. You'll find them uh, in the south, uh, uh, along a beach. First, you have to look for like an older European divorcee. Uh, you can't tell someone's a divorcee by looking at them, but you can though, you know? Like, there's lots of linen and flowy scarves. That's the vibe. Uh, <laughs> The guys are usually sort of very surfer looking guys, uh, and they'll just usually partner up with them. Sometimes they'll even go home and get, uh, go home back to Europe with them and get married. It's, it's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great scam. It's so <laughs> and the guys are usually very surfer looking guys, you know, like darker skin, uh, longer hair, and. <laughs> I'm just saying, if this comedy shit don't work out, I got options, all right? I've been, I've been a whore for free for most of my life. I might as well go pro. This is... I feel like the same thing doesn't quite happen here, though. Like, you, you don't get that much sex tourism in the UK. You don't get women from other parts of the world flying into, into the UK and going to a, to a Weatherspoons in Bolton. <laughs> cruising for a builder named Raj. It just doesn't work out. Like, I started doing comedy there, and that was really nice. You know, this is really the first thing I've done in my life that I feel like is for me. Uh, the only problem was, it was exhausting. I, I still work a full-time job. Uh, I was at the time, and I'd work all day and do this at night. Uh, I was just, you know, like, this sitting down thing is not a part of the act. I'm just tired. You know how exhausting it is being this exceptional? All right, I'm 27 years old. You look in my eyes, that's a 72-year-old man looking back at you. <laughs> But a lot of the people I started comedy with, uh, I just noticed that they had a lot more free time, they were a lot more chill. A lot of them didn't work uh, jobs even. I wondered how that was working. And uh, they just said like, no, you know, we, we, if you're European or from uh, other countries, you can just claim unemployment uh, and you get a check every month and that's all right. And I was just, I was a very jealous, resentful young man at the time. I was just mad that I had to work so hard my whole life to have access to this life. And these people got it just by default. Uh, so much so that I looked it up and apparently Berlin had a 10% unemployment rate, 10%, that's three times Germany's national average. And then I was wondering, how is this even economically possible? Like, who's supporting all these people, some of which are choosing not to support themselves? And then I remembered that 60% of my salary that wasn't actually my salary. I was like, oh shit, am I supporting these European kids' dreams? Is this a, is this a reverse Angelina Jolie situation? What is it happened? You know, I, I understand that high taxes are a big part of the reason that life in a country like that is so nice, but a warning would have been cool. You know? <laughs> I remember the day I got my first paycheck there. Uh, I read the first line with the total amount, and that was more money than I had seen in my entire life before that point in one place. And then I read the second line about how much they took away and realized that in one day I had more money taken away from me <laughs> than I'd ever seen in my entire life before that point. It was very conflicting. I didn't know what would be happy with. I felt like I'd been blindfolded and given the greatest blowjob of my life <laughs> and later found out it was by a raccoon. I didn't even... <laughs> From my conscience, I need y'all to know that that joke doesn't make sense. Uh, it only works because raccoons are inherently humorous creatures. Uh, uh, 
I was dating a lot when I was there. German girls were far more practical than I expected. Uh, this one girl, we got together towards the beginning of winter, and she broke up with me towards the beginning of summer. It turns out she was just in it for the body heat. <laughs> That's not even the worst one. This other girl, we, uh, she was real smart. She was getting her, uh, doing her PhD at the time, uh, writing her thesis. Uh, I used to like her a lot. She used to ask very interesting, insightful questions about Sri Lanka, about my culture, about where I'm from. It made me feel very special until I found out she was writing her thesis in South Asian studies. <laughs> and I found it. I found it and I read it and everything I said was referenced to native number four. How many? How many innocent ethnic men? I had this mark for this. Uh, I felt bad for how good my life was there, you know, because you never quite completely forget where you came from. And this whole time that I'm living away from home, uh, I'm aware of how hard it is for people back home. And I'm just out here in Europe doing comedy and going to orgies and shit. I felt like a selfish person. Uh, I really think I have, you know, the UK is a very conservative country. A lot of people here are very afraid of immigrants. And speaking as an immigrant, y'all should be more afraid. Like we are. <laughs> We're the worst, we really are. We're the most selfish people from our respective places. We're the ones that left everyone else behind on purpose. <laughs> Think about what kind of a sociopath you need to be. To, like, you're born in your place. Uh, uh, it's a little rough, but it's home. You know, your, your friends you grew up with, your family, everyone you've ever loved is from this place. But you're like, nah, fuck all of these people. <laughs> I want Amazon Prime, I'm leaving. I'm too good for this. You never quite forget completely, though. Like you, you, especially with Sri Lanka, you get consistent reminders. The uh, you know, like I remember, uh, 2019, I got a call from my mother on what I thought was a random Monday. She had a very solemn tone in her voice, and she told me that there had been a terrorist attack in Sri Lanka the day before. It's on Easter Sunday, targeting multiple churches around the country. Uh, and she said, no, no friends and family were hurt. I put down the phone. And then I just wanted to get some basic facts on the situation. And I tried to look on news sites. Uh, I couldn't find anything. I went to the Asia-specific section. I couldn't find anything. And the only thing I could find, even in the vicinity of Sri Lanka, was that a new species of jellyfish-like creature called the sea squirt <laughs> had recently been discovered in the Indian Ocean. And I saw this and I was reassured, because at least I knew that no white people had been hurt in the attacks. Uh, <laughs> And from being from Sri Lanka, you get used to that. We know we have a minimum debt toll to make the news out here. Uh, we're aware. But this time made me feel a certain way because you all remember a few years back when the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris started burning and the whole world made a big fuss? Uh, that was just a few weeks before these bombings in Sri Lanka. And it made me so angry that on one day, uh, multiple buildings, hundreds of people were killed, and thousands were injured, and nobody cared. But a week before that, a European building no people, just building. Not even the whole thing, just the pointy part. It started burning. <laughs> and the entire world lost its shit. It was wild. I looked it up a month later and apparently the cathedral had raised over two billion dollars for its restoration. Billion with a B. And Sri Lanka's various efforts had raised a few hundred thousand, which isn't nothing, but it just shows you what people's priorities are, you know, instead of possibly touching the lives of hundreds of children, they'd rather help restore a building where hundreds of children probably got touched. It's a bit conflicting <laughs> where people want to... I'm always worried about that one. <laughs> <laughs> it was real sad when this happened, though, because you know, the war ended in 2009. There was nearly a whole decade of peace, and then this happened, and it started sort of sparking racial tensions in the country again to the extent where now we have, we have militant Buddhist terrorists back home. Uh, these men have no idea how stupid they sound. It's very off-brand. Like, I was raised Buddhist, I still consider myself Buddhist. It's a very chill religion. It's mostly just some, some bum's high thoughts translated into profound-sounding nonsense. You know, like one of our core tenets is that all life is suffering and you escape this suffering by detaching yourself from your earthly desires, which is just a very fancy way of saying, like... <laughs> Yo, shit happens, bro, like... <laughs> Just let it go, man. Just go touch an elephant. It'll be fine. Relax. Just... <laughs> a terrible uniform for a terrorist group as well. You know, orange robes. 
feel like it's very difficult to inspire fear when you have the same color scheme as Fanta. It's a bit silly, it's a hard sell. <laughs> you know, their logic, their logic is that they think uh, they're trying to protect Buddhism from other religions on the island that are trying to take over Sri Lanka's religious life, like Islam or Christianity. And I agree with them to an extent. I too am trying to protect Buddhism. I think they're trying to protect it from the wrong people. I am trying to protect Buddhism from middle-class white women. <laughs> because they are trying to do to Buddhism what they did to hummus and yoga, and I will not allow it, all right? Their power is not to be trifled with. These are a dangerous group. <laughs> I swear, they, 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 the most dangerous neighborhoods in the world have fallen to their might. You know, they took Brooklyn and New York, they took Brixton and London, they'll take Buddhism in Sri Lanka. It won't be, if anything, that's all we needed. You know, the government and the army has been trying for decades and all we ever needed was a few Tarquins and Clementines to go over there and clean shit up. And in a few years, you'll hear people saying things like, yeah, Sri Lanka used to be dangerous, but a friend just came back and said the vibe was really chill. <laughs> Buddhist terror, it, it bothers me though, it really does. Like, how are you even going to be militantly Buddhist? Are you just, you were just really, really chill? You just storm public places, like everybody on the ground right now. Surprise group meditation, like, what are you doing? <laughs> just corner a guy, like breathe in and out, this is dumb. This is rogue behavior. <laughs> I moved to the UK about two years ago. Uh, uh, from Germany, and when I told my friends that I was moving here, a lot of them were very afraid for me. Uh, I'm new here, I'm not trying to comment on your country or your culture too much, I'm just saying that when Germany starts looking at you with fear, you fucked up a little bit, right? Like, <laughs> fair assessment. You know, they say things like, why are you moving there now? Their, their economy isn't great after Corona, uh, Brexit's happening, and I was like, yeah, exactly. You have to strike when they're weak. <laughs> I learned that from them, from you, from the best, the world champions of exploitation. I love it. <laughs> I watch the news sometimes here. Yeah, I hear people say things like immigrants are just here for our resources. Immigrants just want our resources. And I hear this, and it genuinely upsets me so much that so many people know my plan. <laughs> this, why else would I be here? I was born on a tropical island, all right? I grew up in actual paradise. You think I left all of that to come to this mayonnaise-loving, potato-growing piece of dirt for your vibrant culture and delicious food? Get over yourselves. This is, this is an extended business trip, all right? Relax. Is, uh... <laughs> That's not ownership, but honestly speaking, though, out of all of Sri Lanka's previous owners, you're not special, we've had a few. Uh, uh... The UK is my favorite, my, by far. We had the Dutch, we had the Dutch before you, we had the Portuguese first. Listen, fuck Portugal, all right? I will, I will never forgive these people. How are you going to practically invent the slave trade and mess with multiple continents for hundreds of years and in 2022 still be kind of poor? Please, please explain to me how you fucked this up. This is mad. You nearly conquered half the world and now you're a budget alternative to Spain? Get out, this is... I'm not even mad, I'm embarrassed for you at this point, this is silly. It's not okay, you can't do so much to the world for so long and all you have to show after all of this time is custard tots, leaf. I feel like I've, I've lived in the, the, the developed world for a bit too long, though I know for a fact that I have because I've caught anxiety from you people. This is, <laughs> this is your malaria, apparently. <laughs> it's a weird one. I feel like I've always felt like this, but I'm only noticing it now because before anxiety was an appropriate reaction to my surroundings. Uh, uh, and so, yeah, it doesn't really show up day to day too much. It causes weird, random problems in my life. Like, I, I, I take a long time to come because of it. I'm gonna say that again. Uh, just to listen. I, it's a weird problem to have. <laughs> what happens is usually when guys try to last longer in bed, they'll, 
they'll think terrible thoughts and that will help them last longer. And my brain just does that shit on autopilot. That's why uh, uh, it's very annoying because I'll try to complain to my friends about it, especially my guy friends, and they'll always say some dumb shit. Like, oh, that's great, man. That means you can last all night. Listen, you don't want to last all night, all right? What kind of Ethiopian marathon runner sex are you having? Which are lasting all night, all right? It's nothing but painful. You have a sore hip, she has a sore labia. It's just uncomfortable for everyone involved. <laughs> Fucking all night is a conspiracy. <laughs> Propagated by the R&B industry. <laughs> to make us listen to that terrible music past the early 2000s. All right, what, you're gonna take advice on your love life from Chris Brown, really? Uh, I know he's got a lot of his, but he's also got a lot of his, you know his? <laughs> I'm not proud of that one. I'm sorry. I have a little bit though. <laughs> Uh, I try to find a therapist, that's what you're supposed to do when you're feeling like this. And I looked this, this stuff, it's expensive, I looked on the NHS, uh, they had a long wait list and even when they gave me a time, it conflicted with my day job, so I looked for private options. And it was like 50 to 200 every session, you go every week, there's 200 to 800 every month. Uh, I have a decent job now, it's still a lot of money, I feel like a lot of the people touting the benefits of therapy are getting a little help from the universe to pay for this shit. <laughs> They say you can't put a price on your mental health. Yes, you can. This is the price. This is enough for me to not live with roommates anymore. Uh, I'm sure speaking to a professional will help me with my problems, but all I really want to do is take a shit with the door open. I want to, I want to wake up in the morning and cook eggs in the nude and walk around with a buttery dick the rest of the day, like only a free man can. Uh, well, I'm supposed to give someone rent money so they can tell me that it was all my parents' fault? Hey, I know, all right? <laughs> I put thousands of miles in between me and them. That was not an accident. <laughs> a part of me feels like I should though put, 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 make some time and budget aside for it. Only because I've caught the feeling that my dad's developing emotionally quickly, more quickly than I am and I refuse to let this man win. Yeah. <laughs> Like sometimes he'll send me messages on my birthday or sometimes even randomly, it's disgusting. Uh, <laughs> and saying nice things too. Uh, I'll read them like, be saying things like, you know, I love you. I, don't know, I want you to know how proud I am of you and everything you've achieved. And I'll be reading this shit like, this old bitch has gone soft. Like, I'm the mean one in our relationship now. You know, I'm trying to do things to soften myself. Uh, I went on my first like real holiday by myself uh, earlier this summer. I went to, went to Portugal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not Spain, because I'm not doing that well yet. But, uh, you know, it is strange. I feel like I don't need to be this angry anymore. Uh, I feel it myself changing in small ways. Though. Like, I moved to the, to the UK, to South London, at first as an immigrant, because uh, so I, I wanted to pursue comedy more seriously. And then earlier this year, I moved to East London, because I heard the vibe was pretty chill. <laughs> I've become an expat, I'm, I'm terrible. Uh, I've become everything that I hate the most in the world and it feels delightful. Yes. <laughs> I mean, but but I, I still have that anger like, inside you. I still have that, that, that stuff in the basement and that's a strange feeling to know that you know, this is the most stable and comfortable that my life has ever been. I still feel this way on the inside. Like, I'm doing all right, I got a little money now. I didn't solve all my problems, those assholes are right. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. It does solve most of them. Uh, it doesn't make life worth living, but it makes it a hell of a lot easier to deal with. Uh, like almost every day, I'll walk up to the edge of my balcony and think about jumping off. And then I'll realize, like, yo, I got a balcony. That shit worked out all right. <laughs> uh, that's the show, guys. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, Just keep